March 1989, 85 engineers begin development of what would be known as the Widowmaker, the Dodge Viper. At the time, Lamborghini was owned by Chrysler and were tasked with casting an engine block to power Chrysler's rendition of the Shelby Cobra. This was a $70 million budget that was small even back then to develop a big displacement manual transmission track focused street legal race car that would revive the Chrysler brand and oh it did. The Viper would see five different generations and set more than 100 track records before discontinuation in 2017. One of the key features to the Viper's success was its seemingly archaic engine design that would prove to be ultra reliable and simple to manufacture. To understand the success of this car, we have to go back to the first gen Viper. To keep development costs relatively low, Chrysler, with the help of Lamborghini, developed an 8 liter V10 based on the Chrysler 5.9 Magnum 360 V8. Lamborghini's expertise with aluminum helped shed 150 pounds over a cast iron block equivalent. In comparison to the Dodge Ram V10, the Viper had a higher compression ratio, dual throttle bodies, and a cross ram intake, lightweight forged internals with a higher rev limit, ultimately producing 400 horsepower and a diesel-like 450 pound-feet of torque on 89 octane fuel. Even with this seemingly large engine configuration, the Viper still weighs sub 3,400 pounds and the sound was intoxicating. In 1996, a new trim called the Viper GTS was introduced. This was a coupe version with more amenities like AC and airbags and also more horsepower. The V10 retained the same 4-inch bore and 3.88 inch stroke, but compression was bumped to 9.6 to 1 with the redesigned piston. The camshaft was revised with more duration on the intake lows for added cylinder head flow. One of the most recognizable changes was that they ditched the side pipes for a rear exit exhaust, which reduced back pressure and added 15 horsepower on top of the non gt TS cars. Since the Vipers have factory forged pistons, the aftermarket started to experiment with the idea of boosting them, and the true potential of the Viper platform was revealed. In 2002, the Viper picked up the SRT10 nameplate and got an even larger 8.3 liter V10. The bore and stroke was increased to 4.03 and 396. Compression ratio stayed the same while the camshaft lost a little bit of duration on the intake lobe. Even with the slightly milder camshaft, power bumped to 500 horsepower and 525 torque since the new cylinder heads flowed extremely well. Also, the engine alone shaved 200 pounds over the Gen 1 with a much lighter aluminum casting and new intake design. What went away was these engines were no longer forged, rather having hyper-eutectic pistons with a thinner top ring land, which made for excellent naturally aspirated power, but was questionable when adding boost to the equation. <laughs> In 2008, the Viper got one of its biggest horsepower bumps with the new 8.4 liter V10. This was bored out more than the previous generation now to 4.055, had higher compression at 10.2 to 1, had variable valve timing on the exhaust side of the camshaft, you had brand new CNC machine cylinder heads with twin throttle bodies for the intake manifold, and the engine flowed superior to the previous generation with 327 CFM on the intake and 245 CFM on the exhaust. In 2010, the Viper would take a two-year hiatus and then fully redesign from the ground up for the fifth generation for 2013. This carried over the 8.4 liter V10, but with a revised camshaft with more intake duration for top end power, a composite intake manifold that saved weight over the prior aluminum, and the return of factory forged Molly pistons. This would create some of the highest horsepower street-driven cars on the planet with the help of two turbos.
Now, more important than just the all out horsepower that these engines can make, when it comes to a road course setting, which these cars are actually sports cars, and there's versions like the ACR, the American Club Racer, that is meant to be on a racetrack. These pushrod V10s don't have a lot of valve train going on. They're very simplistic, which gives them a lower center of gravity, and as well, they're easy to repair, and they're very reliable in a track setting. These are aluminum block engines that are lighter, and they be, they're able to dissipate heat much better than a cast iron block as well. Take, for example, the Viper ACR. This car set tons of track records across the world and still to this day is the fastest production manual transmission vehicle around the Nürburgring. Every, everybody else has gone to dual clutches, they have dual overhead cams with twin turbos, a naturally aspirated archaic Roman technology V10 with a manual transmission is just as fast as half a million dollar supercars. It's just, sometimes it just needs to be that simple. Are there any downsides to the Viper V10? Well, there's a couple. When it comes to the engines that were made past, like from the year 2000 all the way to 2010, they don't come factory with forged pistons like the older engines do. So if you wanna buy one of those engines and instantly boost them, you're gonna be limited to the amount of power you can add into those solely based off of the design of the piston just like the 392 hemis the 6.1 hemis and, and such that similar design where they make very good naturally aspirated horsepower but not necessarily are they they're ready for boost they have a very tight ring gap where you add boost you add more heat that ring gap gets way too tight and then it catches inside the cylinder wall and breaks the piston now vipers are still relatively simple but when things do break there is the viper tax there's a Corvette tax on anything when it comes to Corvettes, and there's definitely a Viper tax on pretty much one of the, some of the most basic stuff there. You're owning a fifty to $150,000 car, depending on the earlier models to the newer Gen 5s. Yes, you're going to be paying money for repairs or anything like that, especially in the older cars where the a lot of the body panels and things aren't in production anymore. So essentially, if you break something, a lot of times you're going to have to find a used secondhand part, which is going to a lot of times going to get very costly because there's a Viper tax. And last but not least is the obvious. Gen 1 through Gen 4 Vipers, the interiors are kind of trash. Well, in a sense that obviously it's of the era, but it's of the era Chrysler. So that just adds another element to just cheapness. But the Gen 5 Viper did a very good job. Even by today's standards, you look at a Gen 5 Viper interior, you're like, hey, this is freaking nice. Leather stitched everywhere, nice infotainment system, digital dash. Yeah, the Gen 5 Viper really solved that issue. But if you wanna get into the Gen 5 Viper right now in this economy, it's gonna be, it's a six figure car. Um, but the other older ones are a little bit cheaper. You can get those for a little bit less, but you got to deal with, hey, you, you look at the dash a little bit too wrong and it's gonna crack on you. So other than that, any more engines you guys want me to overview, talk about, put it in the comments below. It's 337 speed, catch me on the socials. I'll put it in the links down below. Peace.